Thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to give these lectures. So we have three hours today and one tomorrow, which means you have to bear with me. You might get tired of me already by the end of the day. Uh, so I'm going to cover some topics in quantum field theory that are uh, interwoven. Uh, there, there are some intricate relations between these different ideas. So let me quickly go through about the plan for these lectures. So first, I'll, step, I'll start with some uh, basic introduction into how anomalies creep into quantum field theory, uh, mostly in two and four dimensions. I'll discuss three, three examples. Uh, one is for current algebras, another for central charges uh, in two and four dimensions. Uh, this results have various applications for uh, condensed matter physics, statistical physics, particle physics. But in these lectures, uh, I would not have much time to emphasize the applications. <clears throat> I mean, for example, this has played a major role in the quantum Hall effect in the past. But I'm not going to em emphasize the applications very much because I want to emphasize more the ideas and the formalities of how these things arise. So I'll be mostly talking about the theory, not about the applications. <clears throat> if somebody wants to know about the applications, we can maybe discuss it uh, later in the day or during some break. And so that would be the first part, some uh, very simple anomalies and how they creep into quantum field theory. The second part is going to be more advanced. I'm going to try to define a geometry in the space of theories. And then I will apply these ideas for cyber witten theory, in which there is some space of models. And one can try to compute the geometry in the space of models. Uh, and that would be related to some other anomaly, so, which I will call B-type rather than A-type. So the first part would be about this A-type, the second part would be about B-type, and there would be an application to cyber witten theory in which I will show you that you can compute exactly some uh, properties about theory space. So this, these ideas are a combination of new and old ideas, but this is, this is completely new. Uh, and then the last lecture I'll devote to a topic which is uh, s s completely different about the S-matrix of QCD. Uh, it has some interesting ideas, and it's more like uh, a teaser to, I think, some progress that can be made in this field rather than a lecture in which I'll present some complete results. Okay, now because we have like uh, three hours today, instead of me speaking, uh, it would be very nice if you ask lots of questions and it would be a more interactive session. Otherwise, what I'll end up doing is to basically reciting my notes, which I'll put online today. So there are 70 pages of notes. Uh, they're, very, they're somewhat disorganized, but uh, the gist is there. Uh, so if you don't ask questions, what I'll end up doing is to recite my notes, uh, which would not be very interesting. So, okay, so please ask questions. So let me just start with a little bit of motivations. Uh, so obviously, <coughs> uh, the framework of quantum field theory, uh, the, fr the framework of quantum field theory has singled itself out uh, as a universal framework, a mathematically consistent framework that describes lots of uh, phenomena in physics in many, many different branches of physics. It's even hard to enumerate uh, in cosmology, in condensed matter, in statistical physics, and of course in high energy physics, uh, and even in stochastic processes. So even for people uh, who study stock market, they need to know a little bit of quantum uh, field theory. And in the, each of these instances, the reason that quantum field theory emerges is uh, somewhat different. Uh, so in condensed matter physics, uh, of course, a quantum field theory emerges because you can have particles generated from the vacuum and things like that in the same, re and, and you have sometimes emergent relativistic invariants so you can even get to, you even get to study relativistic quantum filters in statistical physics. It's the old story that stati statistical systems near a critical point, near a phase transition, they have long range correlations. And so you can forget about the lattice structure and you can pass to some continuum description. That's how uh, people understand nowadays critical phenomena, which you must have heard about from Slava. Uh, in high energy physics, obviously we have Lorentz invariants and so, uh, we can have particles generated from the vacuum, so we need to use this framework and so on. So this is a very, very universal framework that can be used to describe many different physical ideas. 
And so it's obvious that anything that we can say about quantum filtering, any general statement that we can make about quantum filtering is going to be useful for many, many people, many branches of physics, and uh, we're still exploring the basic structure of quantum filtering, even though it's four decades old, the framework. We're still trying to explore uh, to what extent uh, we understand the intricacies of the theory, we understand the basic, the basic results in the theory, and so on and so forth. So um, the general picture that, uh, of the general understanding of quantum filtering comes from Wilson's ideas. What Wilson said is that uh, basically you can think about quantum filtering as an evolution process of some sort. So if you look at very, very short distances, so this is going to be, let's say, short distances. So in, in consistent quantum filtering, okay, in consistent quantum filtering, the short distance physics is described by some scale invariant model. And also the very long distance physics is described by other scale invariant model. So there is some scale invariant model here. And in the middle, there is some crossover behavior, which is characterized by some scale. So th there would be some scale, which in particle physics conventions, you can think about it as an inverse mass scale. So there is some crossover from one scale invariant theory at short distances to another scale invariant theory at long distances. And the critical exponents here, so we characterize scale invariant theories by the correlation functions. And the correlation functions in scale invariant theories are some power laws. And these power laws have some exponents gamma n in the infrared. And here there are some other exponents gamma n in the UV. And the crossover interpolates between one, sets of, one set of exponents to another set of exponents. So that's the general framework that Wilson uh, gave us for quantum filtering. So what is the job, what, what is our job in quantum filtering? So this, this kind of scenario is realized, of course, in many instances in particle physics, statistical physics, condensed matter, and so on. For example, one of the first, one of the first examples was, for, example, was a, for instance, a, renormal, a flow from the tricritical model to the Ising model. And this is something that has been observed experimentally long time ago. Um, and there are lots of dozens or hundreds of th or thousands of other examples where we've seen this picture happening in nature. So what, is, what are the interesting questions that we can ask? So the interesting questions could be structural, which is what is the connection between these exponents and these exponents? This is one sort of question that you can ask. Can we go from any scale invariant theory to any other scale invariant theory? Or are there constraints? Are, this, are there constraints that if we specify the scale invariant theory here, there is no crossover that would lead us to some given scale invariant theory here? Uh, you can ask the question of, given a scale invariant theory, can it be the bottom of this crossover behavior? Or maybe it doesn't have any way of uplifting it into what we call a flow. So this is called an RG renormalization group flow. A renormalization group flow. So you, these are sort of structure, structural questions that you can ask of uh, when can a given model be understood as sitting here or here when there is a crossover behavior. You can ask, this is one set of, set of questions. Another set of questions is about what's happening at the crossover scale. So the crossover physics could also be very interesting. For example, deep inelastic scattering, which is a, an interesting experiment in quantum chromodynamics, is more about the cross, what happens here, very near the fixed point. This is called the fixed point, the scale invariant here in the UV. This is more about the physics near the, in the crossover regime, but not very far from the fixed point. Uh, QCD, the hadronic physics, is more about the crossover scale. In uh, statistical physics, critical behavior, these critical exponents that you read about in the books in statistical physics, are about this regime. So not quite the scale invariant point, but very close. That's how you read out critical exponents in statistical physics. So uh, there are different applications of studying the crossover regime, this scale invariant theory, this scale invariant theory. There are also lots of applications in high energy physics. Yes. Yes, there could, the, the picture could be more complicated. It could be that 
It could be that, for example, you start from some scale invariant theory. There is some complicated crossover regime, which actually hovers, hovers near some other approximate scale invariant theory, and then it continues to some other point. The diagram of, uh, of possible renormalization group flows could be very intricate. And um, well, understanding that the global structure is one of the things that you may want to do. Since uh, it's so, I mean, since the framework is so widespread, uh, understanding this global flow, this, the global structure of these possible flows is a very important question. So different people have different tastes for what are the interesting questions. In condensed matter physics nowadays, in fact, uh, they've gone to the extreme uh, because what they are studying are these topological insulators. That's one very big uh, theme in condensed matter physics nowadays. In topological insulators, this scale invariant model in the infrared is empty, so there are no interesting correlation functions. And we, in, when this is empty, we call it a gapped phase. And what they're studying are some non-local observables in these gapped phases. So they're interested in trivial scale invariant theories in which there are some, remi some residual non-local observables that are still sort of interesting, topological observables. And uh, in, in, in statistical physics, of course, people are much more interested in the critical exponents. That's what they measure. They measure local correlation functions. So different communities have different interests, and, uh, but it all, fall under this, um, it all falls under this umbrella, which is very nice. There is one uh, picture that encompasses lots of lots of physics. And so different people have different tastes for what is interesting. So let me tell you what I'm going to describe. Uh, of course, I made uh, a very personal selection of uh, the things that I'm going to describe. So I'm going to describe a little bit. So the first, no, the first thing that I would like to describe is the question of when are the scale invariant points actually conformal? So we've observed experimentally, it's an experimental observation or an empirical observation. We've observed experimentally that sometimes these theories are more constrained than just being power laws. They have some additional symmetry and I would like to give you a quick argument that explains at least for two-dimensional models why you have these extra symmetries. That's the first thing that I'm going to discuss. And then we'll discuss some, some very basic properties of the relations between these critical exponents and these critical exponents. We'll discuss some very simple uh, applications of that idea and some simple results. And then I'll try to describe more collectively the geometry of all the possible theories. So there's some geometric so there is some geometric manifold of all the possible theories and all the possible renormalization group flows, and you can define an interesting geometry and study it. And you can even make exact computations in some supersymmetric theories which allow you to learn about uh, the space of theories. And then in the last lecture, I'll be discussing really the crossover regime where I'll be studying the S matrix of a large N QCD. So I'll cover some topics of various sorts. Are there any questions about this introduction before, and before I start the first topic, which is to explain why the scale invariant models turn out to be conformally invariant, in two dimensions at least. Okay, so, so let's say, start by reminding you about the Poincaré group. That will be very important to remember. So the Poincaré group in D dimensions I'm going to discuss for now uh, the Poincaré group of RD. So the space is going to be RD, Euclidean. Uh, the Poincaré group of RD consists of translations. So we have D translations. And then we have some uh, rotations, okay, which are in SOD. So the, this is the Poincaré group, consisting of translations and rotations. Now, what is a scale invariant model? So there is a formal, there is a, fo a formal definition. A formal, de the formal definition is that the symmetry of the scale invariant model consists of the Poincaré group plus uh, an additional conserved quantity, which we can call delta. That's a conserved charge. So that's a new conserved charge. Which acts on the coordinates by multiplication. 
So that allows you to rescale. And once you add this, once you add this conserved charge to the theory, then everything has to be a power law, because uh, when you measure correlate, when you study let's let's say now correlation functions of two local operators phi one and phi two, this would be at x and this would be at zero without loss of generality. If this has scaling dimension delta one and this has scaling dimension delta two, which I'm sure Slav X talked to you about, then we have to write the following formula, delta one plus delta two. Okay, so everything has to be a power law because this is asymmetry. So now what, for example, Landau did when Landau uh, sort of described for the first time the theory of phase transitions, Landau realized that the fact that there is scale invariance allows you to derive many interesting uh, relations between critical exponents. Uh, and everything that essentially was done back then follows from this idea that two-point functions are given by power laws. Uh, this is, these are the so-called hyperscaling relations that you might, you might have heard about, but even if not, it's not important. Hyperscaling relations. These are some relations in the statistical physics that just follow from the fact that there is scale invariance at the critical point. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the naive, this is the naive description of the scale invariant theory. But experimentally, so an, an experimental fact, uh, an experimental fact is that what we end up seeing in many of these examples is a bigger symmetry. So what we end up seeing is the full conformal group. So we have Poincaré plus this conserved, new conserved charge which, which corresponds to rescaling of space. But we also end up seeing the special transformations. Special conformal transformations. And all of this together forms the group SO D plus one comma one. Okay, so this the generators combine into a big group which is bigger than Poincaré and bigger than this group, the scale group. It's SOD plus one comma one. And this group has lots of interesting uh, consequences. So there are interesting consequences. One of the measurable consequences of having this extended symmetry is that two-point functions are actually diagonal in dimensions. So scale invariance allows you to have a non-zero two-point function between any two insertions with well-defined eigenvalues under scaling. But uh, one of the consequences of the bigger symmetry is that for what's called primary operators, you get a diagonal two-point function for primary operators. And then you have one over x to the power two delta one. Okay, and this has measurable consequences. And in many cases, we know that this is true. This is a consequence of this bigger symmetry, and there are also lots of consequences for three-point functions, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you've seen some of that. Okay, so uh, w the first thing that I would like to do is to explain why there is this symmetry enhancement. So there is the question of, it's a general question in quantum field theory, which is why a Poincaré plus delta often gets enhanced into a SOD plus one comma one. This is Poincaré D. Okay. So it's a very general question that pertains to many applications in quantum field theory, and we don't know. The, the short answer is that we don't know why this is true, but in some cases we can say a lot. We can more or less give a proof in d equals two. This is what I'm going to do now. I'll give you a proof. Uh, in d equals four, there is almost a proof. Almost proof meaning that it's not mathematically rigorous. It's a, a physical argument. So it's almost a proof. And all the other cases, for example, three dimensions, which is most relevant to statistical physics, uh, there has been no progress, essentially. 
And of course, you know that there are also interesting quantum filters in five and six dimensions, and also in those cases, there has been no, not much progress. Okay, so the question is, why does this happen? Why does the symmetry enhancement happen? You might think, you might actually recall when you see this formula uh, that in the hydrogen atom, there is a symmetry enhancement from rotations, rotations to the runge lenz laplace uh, group, which includes an additional generator. So remember that in the hydrogen atom, you have an enhancement from SO3 to SO4. So you might uh, think that understanding the symmetry enhancement is very important because, for example, this symmetry enhancement plays a huge role in the solution of the hydrogen atom. So understanding the symmetry enhancement is a kind of a basic question. So I would like to give an explanation. So, so our journey into all of these topics will begin from studying the two-point function, two-point function of the of the, of the energy momentum tensor, of the energy momentum tensor. I'll start by doing it in any number of dimensions, and then we'll specialize to two dimensions, and we'll see something special happening. So that's the object that I would like to study. I'm going to do it in momentum space, uh, because it's uh, slightly more convenient and one doesn't have to worry about uh, various issues that arise in position space. So I'm going to study this fundamental object, which is the correlation function of two energy momentum tensors with momenta Q. Now, if you're a statistical physicist, you don't call it the energy momentum tensor, tensor you call it the stress tensor, because energy and momentum is carried by something else. So in statistical physics, this object you would call the stress tensor. In high energy physics, it generates energy momentum, so we call it the energy momentum tensor. But in both cases, it's a very fundamental operator that creates some interesting local excitations. So we're going to try to fix this two-point function, but what are we going to assume? So what I would like to assume is just Poincaré. Okay, and we'll do it in steps. We'll first assume Poincaré, then we'll assume scale invariance, then we'll see that you can prove that conformal invariance emerges, so this bigger group emerges, in two dimensions at least, uh, and then we will go further uh, to prove various interesting structural theorems about this two-point function. So we'll just use Poincaré. So if you use Poincaré, you just have to satisfy the various symmetry conditions. So it has to be symmetric in mu nu, it has to be symmetric in rho sigma, and it has to be conserved. Uh, the conservation is the big deal that we'll worry about a lot. Uh, so remember that there is this classical equation whereby this is conserved. And we'll worry a lot about this conservation equation. So you'll see that sometimes we cannot satisfy it, sometimes we can satisfy it. We'll see very interesting applications. But I just have, I want to make a small digression to explain what does this equation mean. You probably saw this equation, you've probably seen this equation many, many times. But what does it actually mean? So when we write a general equation that some operator, some quantum operator, is equal to zero, it has a precise mathematical meaning. The mathematical meaning is that at separated points, when you insert this operator, you get zero. But at coincident points, you might need to be careful so this is an equation that always should be interpreted at separated points. So what it means is that if we insert this operator at some point x1, and then there are lots of other operators, and x1 is different from all the other xi, which sit here, then this vanishes. This is the mathematical meaning of a vanishing operator, that at separated points, it gives rise to vanishing correlation functions. But sometimes you cannot uphold these equations at coincident points. This is where anomalies arise and various other issues creep in. Now, in momentum space, remember that if, when you do a Fourier transform, you integrate over all the possible positions with some weight. And therefore, imposing conservation equations in momentum space is always subtle. And this will be a major theme that we'll discuss. You cannot quite impose these conservation equations right away in momentum space. You have to think what corresponds to separated points and what corresponds to coincident points. 
If you try to impose conservation equations, you get wrong, inconsistent results, as you'll see. Okay, so let's start by just writing all the possible Poincaré invariant pieces, and then we'll discuss the conservation equation. So there are two possible tensors you can write. One in which there are contractions across the two energy momentum tensors, and the other is when there are only contractions uh, in pairs, as you'll see. Uh, just, I wanted just to make another, to remind also that uh, the energy momentum tensor is symmetric in its indices. So this is how the structures are, conserved, are, are constrained. So one possible co contraction is Q mu, Q rho, minus eta mu rho, Q squared, times Q nu, Q sigma, minus eta nu sigma, Q squared. <coughs> A plus rho interchanged with sigma. Uh, and this would multiply any function of Q squared. So let's call this function F. And then there is another possible contraction, which looks like Q mu, Q nu minus eta mu nu. Q squared times Q rho, q sigma minus eta rho sigma, q squared. And there is g of q squared. So these are two tensors that you can write down. So there are two functions, f and g. <clears throat> and I've chosen the tensors in such a way that the conservation equation is obeyed. But you'll see that it's a little bit subtle. We'll discuss more why did I choose these particular tensors, when is it really obeyed, when is it not really obeyed, and so on. This is just a naive first attempt that implements this equation. So in momentum space, this equation can be written as Q mu nu, T mu nu equals zero. Okay, so in general, there are two functions that appear here, F and G. The first claim that I want to make these functions would, in general, be functions of the crossover scale of the momentum over the crossover scale, okay? So in scale invariant models where there is no external crossover scale, this would be some homogeneous function that we'll try to fix. But in general, it could be a function of the momentum over the crossover scale. So one interesting claim that you can make You'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll derive this claim later from another point of view, but you can already, you can, you can try to prove it also from this point of view, is that if the number of dimensions is two, then f and g are, are linearly dependent. So there are not different functions. There are not different tensors. So the claim is that this tensor and this tensor in two dimensions are actually the same. Not independent, so they are not independent. Okay, this is a small claim that I would make. We'll prove it from another point of view, but it's important to appreciate it already at this stage. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about uh, what happens if we impose scale invariance. So we impose that if we impose that there is no uh, external scale in the problem. So everything is just a, some power law of various momenta. Okay, so let's discuss uh, three different cases. Two dimensions, three dimensions, and four dimensions. What happens if we impose scale invariance in these three different cases? Now, <clears throat> You have to appreciate that uh, the energy momentum tensor in position space has dimension d, and therefore its Fourier transform has dimension zero. And because there is always a delta function for momentum conservation, which I've omitted, the right-hand side has to be of dimension d, where d is the number of space-time dimensions. Now, we already have four powers of momenta here and here, and so in two dimensions, it has to be one over q squared. So f and 
g, they have to be some coefficient over q squared. It won't be important to fix these coefficients. It just fo follows from dimensional analysis. Now you could ask, what about logarithms? So we can discuss logarithms a little bit later. You could add various logarithms here and would still be naively consistent with scale invariance, but we'll discuss that later. This is the most uh, straightforward solution. This is the most straightforward choice. Now in three dimensions, f and g are going to scale like one over the square root of q squared. Okay? And in four dimensions, they have to be logarithms of q squared. These are the three cases, two, three, and four dimensions. Are there any questions about why this is true? You could choose either a logarithm or a constant function. It would still be okay, but you'll see later that the only consistent choice is a logarithm, not a constant function. Okay, so these are three cases that you could discuss, but then there is an interesting computation that you can do. You can try to take the trace over the indices mu nu and rho sigma, both of them at the same time. So let's trace over mu nu and rho sigma. So we're going to trace over mu nu and rho sigma. So let's write down the, the answer. So we, we get to study t mu mu of q and then t rho rho of minus q. And we'll do it again in two, three, and four dimensions up to this coefficients that I haven't fixed. So let's start from two dimensions. In two dimensions, f and g are one over q squared. So if we trace over q, if we trace over mu nu and rho sigma, this would be q to the four, this would be q to the four. They would cancel two powers from the denominator and you will get q squared. Okay. This is in two dimensions. In three dimensions, we will get something like q to the four over the square root of q squared. So that's going to be q squared to the power three halves. Yes. Yeah, so if you take TQ, TP, that's what you're asking, right? Then in general, this would be a delta function in the dimension of Q plus P. Why? Because if you create an excitation of momentum P, it has to be absorbed in the vacuum with momentum uh, P. So this creates an excitation from the vacuum with momentum P, and then it gets re what, does, what this describes in the language of statistical uh, physics is that you create an excitation of some momentum P, and then it, uh, it is absorbed sometime later in time. And so it has to be absorbed with the same momentum because we're doing it in the vacuum. Of course, if you do this kind of, uh, if you do these correlation functions in the presence of some non-trivial medium, then some momentum can dissipate into the medium or some momentum can be extracted from the medium and then you don't have a delta function. But I'm doing these computations now in the vacuum uh, where no momentum can be absorbed or extracted from the vacuum. Okay, so uh, I was, so, so I get Q to the four. In four dimensions, we get Q to the four times logarithm of Q squared. Okay, these are the three cases that we've got. Now, uh, the most striking uh, fact about this, uh, about this result is that this is a pure, this is the only case in which you get a pure polynomial. So this is a pure polynomial. Okay. This is not a polynomial. This is a fractional power of Q squared. And this is also not a polynomial because there is a branch cut due to the logarithm. 
there is only one case in which you get a pure polynomial. What does it mean in position space? If you have a polynomial in Fourier space, in position space, it's a delta function. The Fourier transform of a polynomial is always a delta function. That's very important to remember. So what it means is that in two dimensions, the correlation function of p mu mu at x and p mu mu at y, where y is different from x, is vanishing. Or more precisely, the Fourier transform of this polynomial is a Laplacian of a delta function, of the two-dimensional delta function. Okay, so the two-point function of t mu mu in two dimensions vanishes at separated points. In three dimensions, it's not a polynomial. It has a non-trivial inverse Fourier transform, and you get some interesting correlation function. In four dimensions, you have a logarithm. So again, you get an interesting correlation function at separated points. It's not just a pure delta function. Now, you could have asked, it's important to think, why did I choose a logarithm? If I had chosen a constant, which is also consistent with the naive scaling, then this would be also a polynomial. And then I would also get something like that in four dimensions. But let me explain why this is uh, not the right choice. If I had chosen here, if I had chosen here a constant, then all the components of the energy momentum tensor with all the other components of the energy momentum tensor would be pure polynomials. Because this is a polynomial and this is a polynomial, so this would be a constant, you would get pure polynomials. And therefore, all the correlation functions of the energy momentum tensor would not have support at separated points. And that would contradict unitarity and various other things. It would mean that the energy momentum tensor is a trivial operator, which is not good. In two dimensions, this choice does not uh, trivialize the two-point functions. It only trivializes one component, which is the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And so it's okay. But in four dimensions, this is the right choice, and therefore it's not a polynomial. Now, if you have, yes? Which more general situations? Oh, okay, so there is a great question of why didn't I add a log of Q squared? That's the question. Okay, let's discuss that. If I had chosen to multiply it with a log Q squared, then indeed this would not be true and the conclusion would not follow. But let me explain physically why, uh, let me explain why this is not allowed. So you see, what I'm imposing here is scale invariance. Like any other symmetry or, op or operator equation, this should be upheld at separated points. So when we do the Fourier transforms back to position space, the correlation fun functions have to be pure power laws, even at separated points. Uh, sorry, at separated points. They have to be pure power laws. Now, if you had the log Q squared, you would need to divide by some scale, mu squared. Okay, just for dimensional analysis. And if you change the scale from mu to mu prime, the difference is going to be A over Q squared. And when you plug it here, you get something that is not a polynomial. So you violate scale invariance even at separated points. So if I had put a log here, that would mean that there is no scale invariance even at separated points in this model. Okay, so there are no critical exponents. This log is different. Now you can start saying what's, when, when can we add a log and when we cannot add a log. In this log, if we change the scale from mu to mu prime, the difference between the two logs is constant. We look, and, and therefore, it corresponds to a pure polynomial in momentum, which only has supported coincident points in position space. And therefore, it's okay. So this log does not violate scale invariance, which is what we're assuming. But this log does violate scale invariance. So we are not allowed to put it here. And therefore, this result is inevitable. OK, now one final uh, general comment that I wanted to make before I proceed is that in quantum field theory, if we have an operator and it's here mission conjugate at let's say x and zero, if this vanishes for all x, sorry, uh, yeah, if this vanishes, then uh, for x not equal to zero, then the operator is trivial. 
in this is in uni, in good unitary uh, theories where there are no imaginary parts in the action. This is like a norm of a state. You can think about it as a norm, and therefore, if this vanishes, then the operator itself vanishes. When it acts on the vacuum, it doesn't create anything. For if it created something, you would have a non-zero result. You just imagine inserting a resolution of the unity in the middle, and you would get that this is true. So if the two-point function vanishes, the operator vanishes at separated points. And so we conclude that in two dimensions, t mu mu has to vanish. We just proved that. It follows from scale invariance. It's, I've not assumed that there is conformal invariance. It follows from scale invariance that t mu mu vanishes. Now, when if t mu mu vanishes in conjunction with this condition, you get far-reaching consequences. Namely, you get the full conformal symmetry of two-dimensional models. Let me review why this is true. So let's, since we're in two dimensions, let's, uh, let's choose the light cone coordinates. They will be very convenient in what follows. So I'll choose the coordinates x plus and x minus, and correspondingly there's p plus and p minus for the two components of the momentum. So we can write this conservation equation in light cone coordinates, in p plus minus coordinates. So it reads q plus a <coughs> Q plus T plus minus, T plus, uh, Q plus T plus plus, plus uh, Q minus T plus minus equals zero, and Q minus T minus minus plus Q plus T plus minus equals zero. These are the two conservation equations in momentum space, in the light cone space. Uh, T plus minus is just T mu mu. Black. Okay. So if T plus plus, if T mu mu vanishes, which is what I've proven, then these two go away. And we remain with these conservation equations that Q plus times T plus plus and Q minus times T minus vanish. Minus vanish. Or in uh, position space, that means that the d minus of t plus plus uh, vanishes, and d plus of t minus minus vanishes. Okay? This is something that we've proven based on scaling variance. But if this equation is true, I can multiply t plus plus with any function of x plus. So, therefore, it's also true that d minus of any function of x plus times t plus plus vanishes. And d plus any function of x minus of t minus minus vanishes. So you get infinitely many conserved charges if t mu mu vanishes because I can multiply, uh, because I can multiply t plus plus with any function that I want and that generates the full Virasoro algebra. So that's the infinite dimensional conformal algebra uh, that you certainly heard about in two dimensions. Okay? So you see that you can, we proved in 15 minutes a very far reaching result in quantum field theory, which is that in two dimensions, if you just assume scale invariance, which is just saying that you have power laws, you get the full Virasoro, you, you get the full Virasoro symmetry. And the only ingredients that went into the proof were unitarity meaning that I uh, assume that the resolution of the identity uh, is present, and also that all the states have positive norms, and Poincaré invariance in, with scale invariance in the usual sense. So uh, this is a very strong result that we know is true in two dimensions, and it explains why in quantum field theory, the scale invariant points that appear at long distances, at short distances, are actually Virasoro invariant theories which are much more constrained, and, and there are many experimental consequences of, the, of, of, of having this Virasoro group. So unfortunately, you see that this, simplest, this argument does not carry through to three dimensions or four dimensions, because we get uh, two-point functions which are non-vanishing at separated points of T mu mu. <clears throat> so there doesn't seem to be an easy way 
of that sort to prove that scale invariance implies conformal invariance. You can assume that conformal invariance is true, and then TMU vanishes, and then you can proceed. But you can't prove it in this way from first principles. You have to do something much more elaborate, presumably. OK, are there any questions about this part? Yes. Right, this is, like an, this is like a local operator. This is just zero as an operator, as a local operator. Yeah. Uh, typically you mean when there is conformal invariance or what? Right, right, indeed. So, yeah, I'll repeat the question. So, suppose, suppose, you, so in four dimensions, we can't prove that scale invariance implies conformal invariance. So let me just repeat the question. The question was, uh, what happens if you don't have conformal invariance? That's my interpretation of the question. Then this is not true, but maybe some weaker form of this equation is true. Okay, so indeed, uh, indeed, let me quickly tell you uh, what, what do we know if there is no conformal invariance. So if there is no conformal invariance, then T mu mu does not vanish as an operator. Rather, T mu mu, we know, is equal to the gradient of some other operator. So it's not a completely general operator, it's just the gradient of something. The, I mean the divergence of something. How do we see that? There is this charge that I defined, which exists in scale invariant models. Uh, this, this is the integral over d, d minus 1x over some space like slice of some current, which we can call a, a let's call, let's denote this current by uh, B. And this current B is given by a x nu t mu nu plus uh, v mu. This is a general form for this current, which is conserved, and whose integral gives the scale charge. Now, for this current to be conserved, you need to satisfy this equation. Just hit it with nabla mu, uh, use the fact that the energy momentum tensor is conserved, and you'll get that t is the, is the gradient of v. Now, if T vanishes, then the gradient of V vanishes, and then you get many more conserved charges. But if you don't have conformal symmetry, the only thing you know is that the integral of B naught is conserved, and that's it. So the integral of B naught is very close to what you said. It's a, a V naught plus X, I, X nu T zero nu. So if there is no conformal invariance, this is all we can say, that there is some operator V whose gradient is it, whose divergence is t, and that's it. But if you have conformal invariance, you have a much stronger result because you know that this vanishes and this vanishes. You can throw it away, and you have lots of new conserved charges. So scale, conformal invariance is indeed much stronger than scale invariance, but it's not always easy to prove that fixed points have conformal invariance. In fact, Landau did not anticipate it. Landau never used conformal invariance. He just used scale invariance in his theory of second order transitions. Uh, but I think in the late 70s, or maybe mid 70s, it already became apparent that all the known models do happen to have conformal invariance. And uh, many people wrote early papers on trying to explain that. But still, the only case in which it's completely well understood is two dimensions, and to some extent, four dimensions. OK. Uh, now I'm switching to the new topic. Well, it's not completely different. I'm just going to talk about gravitational anomalies, uh, gauge anomalies, and all that. And how they evolve under renormalization group transformations. So let's have this picture in mind. Now we are smarter. We know that this is a conformal field theory. This is some other conformal field theory. I'm going to do uh, two dimensions. I'm going to discuss two dimensions for now. So we're a little smarter. We know that this is the picture. And here there is some crossover uh, in the middle between the two theories. 
So the question that I'm going to ask now is, are there in interesting quantities that have to be the same here and here? So maybe the critical exponents may change, many things can change, but some things may be preserved under this evolution. Or maybe there are some inequalities along this evolution. So I'm going to study two examples of things that are preserved or have a controlled evolution. Uh, and you'll see what kind of ideas go into that. So I'll start with something simple, which is uh, to suppose that this whole evolution preserves a U1 symmetry. So there is some global symmetry. And then we'll generalize it to uh, central charges and so on. So I'm going to assume that there is some global symmetry. So we have some current, which is preserved everywhere. It's preserved every, everywhere, not just at the fixed points. We just have a, a complete global, a, a complete, honest to God, uh, global symmetry that's preserved along the flow. And there are many examples of that sort. For example, take the O2 model, okay, uh, which is an interesting, uh, an interesting, which has interesting applications in statistical physics. So we have a honest to God uh, conserved current, and I'm going to study its correlation function. In the, same, in the same way as we did with the energy momentum tensor and prove some general facts about it. So we will use light point coordinates in which there are three interesting correlation functions to study. And I'm going to use momentum space again because in momentum space, anomalies in general are, are much easier to discuss in momentum space. So I'm going to write down the most general possible answer that follows from Poincaré invariance. And then we'll use the conservation equation. We'll discover that sometimes it's anomalous, sometimes it's not anomalous. And we'll try to see uh, how does this story go. So just from Poincaré invariance, you have to put uh, a p plus squared over p squared times some function which is of dimensionless, dimensionless function of p squared over the crossover scale. How did I get to these sunsets? So the fact that you have to have two powers of p plus is obvious. That's just boost invariance. Now, the fact that a is dimensionless follows from the fact that, the, that a current has dimension one in two dimensions. So the dimension of the current is one, and therefore its dimension in Fourier space is minus one, and we have a delta function, so this thing has to be dimensionless. This is given by some function b of p squared over m squared, which is some dimensional function, a dimensionless function. And this is p minus squared over p squared times some function c of p squared over m squared. So far, I only used dimensional analysis. Uh, I did not assume scaling invariance, just dimensional analysis and boost invariance. And uh, of course, a Poincaré, well, the, the full Poincaré group. That's what I used so far. OK, now, so now there is a very interesting and subtle story about what does the conservation equation imply. Okay? So this is a very interesting and subtle story. Perhaps uh, if you haven't seen these kind of things before, that would be extremely confusing, and you'll have to think about it. But uh, I'll try to explain it to the best of my ability. So suppose you just imp impose the conservation equation. Suppose you just impose the conservation equation. So you impose that p plus on j plus is, uh, uh, is, uh, equal, is equal to minus p minus on j minus. So the conservation equation in the momentum space is p plus uh, p minus j plus plus p plus j minus equals 0. So that's the conservation equation in the momentum space. And you can just impose this equation on these three possible functions. So the, conclu the conclusion, the naive conclusion that you find is that these three functions have to be identical. Okay. Now, if you imp if you impose this condition, you'll end up you'll end up getting lots of paradoxes. Uh, for example, you won't be able to reproduce these results by Feynman diagrams. There will be some contradictions with unitarity, and so on and so forth. So the naive application of the conservation equation fails. And the reason is that you have to be very slightly more careful. What the conservation equations actually imply is a slightly weaker equation. 
they imply that p squared of a squared of a p squared over m squared is equal to p squared of b and equal to p squared of c. So if you allow yourself to divide by p squared, then you get this equation. But there may be some subtlety with p squared with, at the origin, okay? Another way to say, another way to try to describe where the subtlety is, is that when we impose the conservation equation, then the, we basically want to demand that this would be true as an operator equation. Now, operator equations cannot be imposed at coincident points. That's, that sometimes may lead to inconsistencies, and this is one example where it would lead to inconsistencies. So what you actually have to require is that this equation is true at separated points, and you should allow yourself some freedom in what's happening at coincident points. So the fact that there is a p-squared here means that you should only satisfy these equations up to things that would correspond to polynomials in momentum space after you hit them with a derivative. So the actual general solution of the word identity is not that a is equal to b equal to c, but it's the following. So the plus plus correlation function, I'll just call this plus 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 minus and minus minus to make the notation simpler. So the, the actual solution is p plus squared over p squared, and then there is a, which is some function of p squared over m p squared over m squared, plus some constant, which I will call k left. Why is this constant allowed? Because when we try to study the conservation equations, because we hit everything with p squared, that corresponds to a polynomial in momentum space, which is a contact term. So it doesn't actually change the fact that this equation is upheld because it should be only upheld at separated points, not at coincident points. Now plus minus. For pi plus minus, we get b of p squared over m squared plus some other coefficient that we call k. We don't know what k is. We just put it there because we may. <coughs> and minus minus is given by, sorry, this is the same function a. And minus minus is given by p minus squared over p squared a p squared over m squared plus k right. So this is the most general solution to the word identities. I've included three new constants beyond the naive solution. So the classical solution would be a equals b equals c. But in fact, we may not be able to impose this equation at coincident points. And therefore, I allowed three new constants, k left, k, and k right. Okay, and without loss of generality, and without loss of generality, uh, we may assume, I'll be done in a second, we may assume that the function a of p squared over m squared goes to zero at very high momentum. Because if it doesn't go to zero, then we can absorb the constant in uh, this case. So without loss of generality, we can assume that this is true. So what I claim is that these three constants are necessary. They are physical. And you can't determine them from the conservation equation. Okay, They are completely free. Now, one comment before I'm done. This k here is a pure number. It doesn't multiply any function of momentum. So this is a contact term already before you hit it with a conservation equation. So this is just some delta function, a completely uninteresting delta function. While this guy only becomes a contact term after you hit it with a derivative. But before you hit it by a derivative, it's a non-trivial function, p plus squared over p squared. p squared is just p plus times p minus in light cone coordinates. So this is basically p plus over p minus. It's a non-trivial function, and its Fourier transform is not a contact term. So this actually, this actually does have some implications for separated points physics. So does this. So these two, k left and k right, are completely physical, measurable quantities, because they have some effect on current correlation functions at separated points. This is completely ambiguous. 
This you can play with whatever you can play with to your delight. You can try to set it to be one, zero. Maybe you can try to set it to be equal to this or to this or some geometric or some average of these two quantities. So this is completely ambiguous, but these are completely physical. And the fact that they can be different is in violation with this naive classical conservation equation. So if k left and k right are not the same, the wide identity, d mu, j mu, cannot be satisfied at a coincident points. And that's where an anomaly arises. Uh, so what am I going to do next? What I'm going to do next is I will prove that if we have some RG flow, of our normalization group flow of that sort, we know, and we know something about k left and k right here, then we know something about k left and k right here. So these are completely different physical regimes, but you'll see that some information about this case is preserved. The difference is preserved, and the sum gets decreased. And we can prove it rigorously using some ideas that will take me 15 minutes to develop. But uh, maybe I'll finish by asking if there are any questions about that. This is a very subtle uh, business, and you should be confused. So. Right, so that's a great question. This is at the core of uh, how uh, anomalies creep into quantum field theory. That conservation equations, these conservation equations classically just mean that, you know, uh, like charge is preserved, or, you know, the amount of charge that enters some region is equal to the amount that uh, came from somewhere else. So the, basically, this just classically means that ch charge is preserved. But in quantum field theory, this is promoted to a local quantum operator, a Hermitian operator in this case. And so when you write this equation, it's an equation about some operators, Hermitian operators detected in some Hilbert space. And you have to understand what does it mean mathematically to write this equation. What it means mathematically is that when you study correlation functions of this operator, this quantum operator, with other operators, this will indeed be true, but only as long as this operator does not hit a, an operator that sits at a coincident point. Why is that? Good. So I'll give you, I'll answer the question of why is that, which is a great question by an example, okay? I'll give you a quick example, which is the Klein Gordon field, a free Klein Gordon field. So the equation of motion of a free Klein Gordon field is that. Agreed? Classically, this equation is true. It's a set in stone, it's a true equation. But quantum mechanically, we have to interpret it as an operator equation because we, there, are, there may be some examples where we would not be able to satisfy this equation at coincident points. So let's see why. Remember the propagator. In four dimensions, this propagator is one over x, oh, sorry, I forgot, is one over x minus y squared, right? Now let's try to hit it. This is some, these are some quantum operators. Let's try to hit this equation with a box. So if this is a true operator equation, then this better vanish when x is not equal to y. But if you take the Laplacian of this function, you get a delta function. This is the green function in four dimensions. So what you get is a delta of x minus y. So you see that quantum operator equations, sometimes you just can't satisfy them at coincident points. You can satisfy them at separate points, but sometimes it's just forced on you that they have to be violated. You see? This is the simplest example one can give, where it's just impossible to make sure that this equation would be true at coincident points. Now, usually these coincident points are dismissed as unphysical, but you see that in these cases, uh, if I'm really careful about the meaning of this equation of imposing it only at separate points, you get these new coefficients, k left and k right, which uh, correspond to separated points physics. Only when you hit it with another derivative, they become coincident point physics and uninteresting. But before you hit it with a derivative, that's a genuine uh, non-zero correlation function at separate points. And it was measured in the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so in the quantum Hall effect, there is such a, a k left is equal to one, k right is equal to zero in some sense. Okay, 
So this coincident point physics may some, most of the time it comes from some other correlation function which has the support at separate points. Like in this example, the fact that this is non-zero at coincident points can be traced to the fact that there is a propagator, which is physical. So uh, one has to be really careful with these operator equations because if you were not careful, you would miss the fact that there is k left and k right. And in some models, like a right moving fermion, you would not be able to write consistent correlation functions. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, are there any other questions about that? Okay. Okay, thanks.